Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Jonathan Bass, and I handle a lot of the content here at Revenue Well. And this is our monthly Practice Perfect webinar series. Every month, we like to just kind of drop a little knowledge, find uh, an industry leader to talk about some things in the area of dentistry that you know kind of help us along our way. This month, we have the uh, practice mechanic, Rick Garfalo to help us bust some HIPAA myths, really kind of get to the bottom of this nebulous type act. Um, so the way this uh, webinar will go is I'm going to pass it off to Rick here in a couple seconds. Uh, he's going to give a presentation. Afterwards, we'll have a Q&A. So if any questions pop up during this, please submit them uh, and we will go through them at the end. And um, and then we'll call it a day. Uh, this webinar is being recorded. We will email a recording out to everybody afterwards, and uh, it'll also be available on our Revenue Well uh, YouTube page. So with that, I'm going to pass it over to Rick, and uh, let's get started. All right. Well, thank you very much, Jonathan. I certainly appreciate being invited and appreciate everybody who's attending today um, and those watching it recorded who weren't able to make it because of work schedules. Um, just a, a 30 second little background on me. I've been in the, the dental industry for uh, 19 years now. My wife is actually a dentist. That's how I got kind of sucked into the dental field because I was a business guy and she needed help at her office with the business end of things and I got pulled in um, to help her. So been doing it for 19 years and OSHA and HIPAA for the past 15. Um, you know, after working with a number of clients all over the country, it became quite obvious that OSHA and HIPAA were big hot buttons for everybody and were something that really needed some light spread on them. So I am an OSHA authorized outreach trainer so I'm authorized by the Department of Labor to teach OSHA. We're actually the only people who are allowed to teach OSHA. Um, I'm also a certified HIPAA professional and a certified security compliance specialist from the Department of Health and Human Services and the Office of Civil Rights. So, you know, I spend a lot of time in Washington, D.C. every year uh, working directly with DHHS and the Department of Labor. So you know, I really do stay on top of these things and I think it's truly important to bust these myths that are out there. You know, there are a lot of people out there who will tell you the wrong thing to sell you a product. And you know, quite honestly, it drives me crazy. So, you know, I want to get everybody out there understanding and knowing what the HIPAA myths are um, and really how it helps us. So we'll get right into it. Like Jonathan said, if you have questions, submit them. We will have a Q&A at the end. And I'm happy to answer any, any questions that anybody has. So we'll get started here with myth number one. Uh, HIPAA prohibits or discourages emailing your patients. This is a big one. You know, I belong to, oh gosh, probably 15 or 20 different dental Facebook groups. And this is a question that always comes up. And you know, the fact of the matter is you are allowed to email your patients. There's just certain guidelines that have to be followed. Um, <coughs> excuse me. You are allowed to communicate via email or other electronic forms. You just have to have reasonable safeguards in place. Okay, When you're emailing protected health information or personally identifiable information that would identify who a patient is, it should be encrypted. It's a simple process, okay? Now, that's for PHI, per protected health information, or PII, personally identifiable information. If you're emailing an appointment reminder, you're fine. You, you, that doesn't have to be encrypted. Um, so, you know, you just have to have what would be considered reasonable safeguards, okay? Those could include things like double checking to make sure you have the correct email address. I, I get calls a couple times a week 
from clients who will say, oh my gosh, we typed in a new patient's email and you know, the the front desk person put a, a R instead of an S and it went to the wrong person and the person replied with, hey, sorry, wrong person. You know, did we just have a breach? Did we just have that? You really didn't. I mean, it depends on what you were emailing, but the chances are slim. But you know, double check. Just make sure you have the right email address. Have that as a written policy for your office in your HIPAA compliance manual that is the training for your team. Have it in there. When you're entering email addresses, double check. Make sure that these safeguards are, are part of your programs. Okay, Whatever those safeguards may be, make sure they're a part of your written program. Because just like with chart notes, if it's not written down, it didn't happen. So you really want to make sure everything is documented and that your staff receives the compliant training every year. Okay. Appointment reminders, confirmation, and other communications without protected health information does not need to be encrypted unless the patient specifically requests confidential communication. I've been doing this for a long time, and I've not once had a patient say, here's my email address, but only email me encrypted emails. They've, I've not one time had that happen. So it's really not something that's gonna come up that often. If it does, excuse me, if it does, you send them encrypted. It's, it's really not a big deal. And they're so, so many different encryption methods out there um, that are, affordable, easy to use, you know, Office 365 works right in Outlook. It, it syncs with all of the practice management softwares. There's so many out there, find one that you love and use that. But again, I've not one time had a patient request that. So it's not something you're gonna come across every day. So myth number two, you need a signed release form when sending records to another doctor. This one comes up every single day. In one of those 20 Facebook groups, every single day this comes up. Sometimes it comes up because an office manager is posting, oh, you know, we got a phone call from another dental office asking for x-rays for a patient. I'm not sending them until we have a signed release. Other times, <laughs> It'll be a dentist posting saying, I can't believe I called this office. The patient was in the chair for an emergency visit, called them because they had just taken bite wings three months ago. They refused to send them to me. So it, it really goes both ways. But the fact of the matter is, you do not need a written or signed request to release records to another covered entity. It's not required. It's not even suggested. Okay, you can disclose PHI and PII without the patient's consent as long as it's for treatment, payment, or operations of your business. So what does that mean? You do not need the patient's consent in order to submit a claim to their insurance company in order to get paid. That's for payment. You do not need the patient's consent to send their x-rays or records to another dental office if it's for continuation of care, if it's the, the patient is going there for treatment. And operations of your business. This could be something as simple as sharing the patient's records with a collection agency or with an insurance company in case of an audit. You don't need the patient's consent. Now, you haven't since 2013, since the final rule was introduced in 2013, you do not need the patient's consent if it's for treatment, payment, or operations. We call it TPO. You do not need the patient's consent for that. If you ask for their consent on your notice of privacy practices, they have the right to withdraw consent. 
But if you don't ask for it, they don't have the right to withdraw consent. So they potentially could prohibit you from sharing that information with a collection agency or with your business associate. You know, could you imagine if a patient said, listen, I don't consent to you sharing my information with your business associates. That means effectively your IT company can no longer access your server. That means revenue well can no longer link to your server. So, you know, please, 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 as of 2013 and the final rule, you do not need the patient's consent for TPO, treatment, payment, or operations. Please don't ask for it. If you haven't updated your notice of privacy practices since then, please do so now. There's a million samples out there. You can call me or email me. I'll be happy to send you some. Please, please, please update it. Um, you know, I, I could run hours over our time today if I were to share all of the horror stories with divorced parents and one withdrawing consent and we're not able to bill the insurance and then the father says, well, sorry, I'm withdrawing consent. You can't send the information to the insurance company and you can't send me a bill because I didn't sign the financial agreement, bill my ex-wife. It, it creates a lot of messes. So you know, please, please, please get rid of your old notice of privacy practices. Do not ask for permission. Okay, again, you do not need the patient's consent to send those records to another doctor. It's continuation of care. It's covered and considered part of the treatment. You do not need their permission. Um, you know, it, it kind of makes us in the dental world look like we don't know what we're doing when you do get a patient who knows and understands the HIPAA law. Like I'm the worst patient in the world because I understand it all. Um, it, it doesn't make us look great when we're asking for things that a simple Google search tells you is no longer, no longer needed. So please, please, please don't do that. Um, you know, if you get that call, the other office alerted you to the fact that the patient's coming to receive treatment. That, that fulfills the requirement. Okay? You can send the records without their consent. Now, everybody says, but what if that other office is obtaining them illegally? What if that person's not really going to that office? Maybe it's an ex-girlfriend or an ex-boyfriend or a, a, you know, <laughs> a spiteful dentist trying to get back at, for, I mean, who knows? You know, it could be a million different things. If the other office uses their position to obtain the records illegally, they actually can be criminally charged. Okay, one of the things we are going to talk about later is the final rule in 2013 added personal criminal penalties, not only for owners, but also for employees as well, for violating any of the HIPAA standards. So, you know, please, please, please understand you don't have to be scared because if my wife's office calls your office and says, hey, send us these x-rays and you find out later, you know, maybe the patient comes in for their recall three months later and you say, hey, you know, how did it go with Dr. Dina? Oh, uh, what are you talking about? I never went to see her. You immediately call the Office of Civil Rights. That other person, the person who made that phone call, who requested those records can actually be arrested and you know, right now the minimum sentence is a two-year federal prison sentence. Um, so don't be afraid of that. If they obtain them illegally, that's on them, not on you. So <laughs> myth number three, you can hold a patient's records if they owe a balance or won't pay your records fee. You're not permitted to withhold or refuse to provide records to a patient or to another doctor because the patient owes you money. You're just not allowed to. It's not permitted. It's not okay. Every state has its own definition of what time frame you have to release those records in. California says 15 days after request. So within 15 days after you receive the request for records, whether it's a phone call or a written request, you have to release them. Colorado and Illinois say 30 days. 
which by the way is the federal standard okay hawaii is only 10 days i have a number of clients in hawaii they have 10 days to release those records that's considered reasonable for film x-rays and paper charts if you're electronic if you have digital x-rays and, and electronic records there's no reason to delay in sending them there there really truly isn't send them as soon as you can send them encrypted and you're good to go <laughs> okay but follow these guidelines if you don't know what your state's guideline is reach out shoot me an email give us a call we'll be happy to happy to fill you in and let you know exactly what your state's policies are um but you have to release them okay your state may require less than a 30-day turnaround but under no circumstances can a state rule be more than the federal mandate so there's no state that can say oh you have 45 days the federal mandate is 30 days that's the most you can have Okay, yeah, think of the federal rule as the absolute minimum. It's like the least you can do. State rules can be more strict, but they can't be less strict. And when a state and federal law are different, you have to follow the stricter of the two laws. So if the Fed law says 30 and your state says 10, you have 10 days. Okay no state can say you have 45 days because they can't be more strict so you know going back to that one thing i do want to tell you and this this comes up a lot and if you have questions please please ask them and let me know but this comes up a lot where somebody says well we charge 30 dollars for a copy of a record I'm not going to release this patient's records until they pay me that $30. You can't do that unless your notice of privacy practices specifically says what the charge is for records. And please know it cannot be a flat rate. Okay, you need to charge a fee based on your costs. So you know, flat rating a record doesn't work. You can charge 20 cents a page, 15 cents a page, a dollar 20 a page, depending on the state. Um, there is no federal guideline on cost, but it is a reasonable fee to cover your expenses. Okay, you're not profiting on this, you're just covering your expenses. So, you know, many, many of the states, 43 of them actually, have very specific this is how much you can charge rates per x-ray per um page of copying from charts or printing have that pricing on your notice of privacy practices and if your notice of privacy practices does not say specifically you're going to charge that fee before records are released, you cannot hold them. You can bill the patient for your copy charge, for your, your duplication fee, but you cannot hold the record until it's paid. Just like a past due balance. You know, a patient could come in, get three crowns, their check bounces and they never pay you a nickel. If that patient comes in a year later and requests their records, you have to release them. The fact that they owe you money does not matter. And you cannot withhold records because a patient owes you money. Okay, this question comes up all the time. And it's something that is super, super important for people to understand because I've actually lately seen, not among you know, my dental friends on Facebook, but among... Uh, the people I went to high school with, my my non-dental Facebook friends, I've seen things floating around saying, oh, you know, did you get a bill from your dentist or from your doctor? Call them and ask for an accounting of disclosures, which is, you're right, under HIPAA. They'll waive the bill because they don't want you to be difficult. 
you know, is your dentist or doctor holding records because you owe them money? Call and file a complaint. I mean, these are like memes or, or you know, articles that were posted by, by some, I don't even know what you call them, um, you know, some consumer protection advocate basically teaching people how to get out of paying their bills. And, you know, they've really been floating around a lot for the past few months. Um, listen, there, there are times when getting a uh, accounting of disclosures is a great thing. I had to do it for my daughter. If you don't know what that is, let me know. <laughs> well, we can have a further discussion another time. But I did get one against my insurance company for my daughter. It worked out great. The claim they were denying was paid literally within 15 minutes of me requesting one. So, you know, you guys have to know what these things are so you know how to handle the requests when they come in. That's that's really the important thing. And that's why understanding the HIPAA laws and knowing the truth about them is so important because you are gonna get requests and it only takes one time to cause a huge, huge headache. So please, please, please make sure, do your research, understand, take, take a course that's taught by somebody who knows what they're talking about to cover the HIPAA laws. Um, you know, please, please, please make sure you do that. You know, I, I, again, just want to just wanna reiterate, you know, please understand when you get the request, even if the patient owes you money, release the records. It, it doesn't matter. And if your notice of privacy practices doesn't specifically state you have to pay the record fee, the duplication fee in advance, you cannot hold the records until they pay that fee either. So you know, please, please, please know and understand that. That is, is a super important thing for people to understand. So you know, at this point, I don't know, Jonathan, do you wanna hop back in for the, the intermission? No, I think we're good. I think you can just keep going and then That's... we will um, just tackle all the questions at the end because I think we're going to accrue quite a few here. That's kind of what I what I figured. So, you know, we will skip right through. Um, you know, one note that I want to do want to talk about um, when you're releasing those records, specifically when you send a patient's chart to another provider, send the whole chart. OK. X-rays from five years ago, we all know they don't help us. You know, a pan from 2010 isn't going to help us. Bite wings from 2013 do nothing for us. Um, but send the whole chart, okay? Send the notes. Send services. Send a copy of the ledger so the other dentist can see what's been done on that patient. The other thing now, there are three states that don't allow you to release collection information. However, in the other 47 states, release the ledger. If you don't want to send the chart because the patient owes you money, send a copy of the patient ledger along with the rest of the chart to the new doctor. You know, wouldn't it be great? I mean, how many of us have gotten a call from a new patient and it sounds wonderful and we're so excited and oh, here we go, we got another new patient, we're fantastic and the patient walks in the door and doesn't pay you. You know, they're, they're a deadbeat patient that doesn't pay. You happen to bump into the dentist, I don't know, three or four months later that they, they uh, came from and find out, oh yeah, they, they owed me money too. You know, they're just a hopper that goes from office to office never paying. Send a copy of the ledger. You know, don't you wish other offices would tell you, hey, here's that patient's record. By the way, they owe us $840 that they've never paid. And here's a copy of the chart we got from their previous office that they were at. They owe him 600 bucks. Here you go, good luck. You know, I wish people would tell me when that was coming. I wish I would get a heads up. You know, dentistry isn't a me versus you thing. It's a, 
really should be a community. You know, yes, there's business competition, but you know, we really, really should be helping each other because the only ones fighting for us are us and we need to work together on that. So let the new provider know the patient owes you money. Get the heads up, provide the patient's entire chart, notes, ledger, x-rays, intraoral pictures, send it. Now, that's to another provider. It becomes part of their chart with the new provider. However, to the patient, I give them exactly what they request. Okay, you legally have to give them everything, including your chart notes, including everything. But you only have to give them what they ask for. So if the patient calls me and says, can you please send me a copy of my x-rays? Absolutely, here you go. That's what I send, I send them x-rays. If they say, can you send me a copy of my chart? I will ask them, what do you want? Are you looking for a list of services? Are you looking for just your x-rays? What are you looking for? And let them tell you specifically what they want, okay? Because if you're digital and they say, send me a copy of your chart, I'm going to send them a copy of the tooth chart showing completed items, proposed items in my specific office's color coding uh, based on my practice management software settings. That's their chart to me. If they want notes or a, a ledger of services, history of services, they need to request that. X-rays, they need to request. Um, but another, another provider, I want to play nice. I want to share everything I can. Now, not only if the, if the patient owes me money to give the other dentist a heads up, but also to help them out. You know, the more information they have on the patient's history, quite honestly, the better they can treat the patient and the easier it makes the transfer. And ultimately, that's what we all want to do. We, we really want to make our life easier and we do that by making other people's lives easier as well. So, you know, please don't be scared to, to send everything you can because you want it to. You would want that information. You would appreciate it if somebody sent that to you. So, I know Jonathan said he's getting some questions here. So, I do want to, you know, just keep going and move through these last four and then, you know, hopefully be able to leave. 20 minutes or so for for questions and I can I can certainly continue to answer questions you know contact Jonathan let him know your questions and I will I promise you I will respond to everyone now <laughs> if a patient refuses to sign a notice of privacy practices acknowledgement you can't treat them this was just a 600 comment post on a dental office manager Facebook group last week. This came up, patient refuses to sign our acknowledgement of receipt of notice of privacy practices. What do we do? Because I'm sending him away. So you can treat patients who refuse to sign your notice of privacy policy, but you should consider if you want to treat them. Now, here's why I say that, you can, okay? If they refuse to sign, you can still treat them. It's not a medical history. It's not a consent form. Those absolutely require a signature. This is just an acknowledgement saying you tried, well, the acknowledgement that the patient signed saying that they received your notice of privacy practices. If the patient doesn't want to sign it, all you have to do is have any front desk person sign it and write patient refused to sign. That's it, that is all you need to do. Okay. Have a witness sign it and you're done. Now, with that being said, if the patient refuses to sign your NPP, think if you really want to begin treatment with them. Okay, there's no law that says they must but you also get to choose what patients you treat. If they don't want to sign a HIP, simple HIPAA form, how likely are they going to be to want to sign a consent form? How likely are they going to be to sign a treatment plan? 
how accepting of your guidance, of your diagnosis, are they going to be? Right? What does refusing to sign a simple acknowledgement of receipt say about the trust that they have in you and your team? So do you legally have to turn them away? Absolutely not. But think long and hard if that's the type of patient you want. Some dentists out there will say, I want every single patient, no matter how difficult they are. Great, take them, have them, here you go. Other dentists want to cherry pick. They want the best of the best. They want the patients who, when, when I say to a patient, you need three crowns, the guy goes, okay, can you do them today? You have to decide what type of patient you're willing to accept and the difficulty level that you're willing to put your team through. So again, there's no law that says they absolutely positively must sign that acknowledgement. You can write, refuse to sign, front desk signs it, a witness signs it, you know, can be another, another team member. They sign it and you're done. You're good to go. You can treat the patient. They don't have to sign it. But think long and hard if that's the type of patient that you want in your office. So this is one that probably drives me the craziest. We meet our HIPAA annual training requirements at the state dental meeting every year. I take my team, we take their four hour or three hour morning half day HIPAA class at the state association meeting. And that satisfies the Office of Civil Rights that the Office of Civil Rights is the entity that's in charge of enforcing the HIPAA laws. That satisfies the OCR's policies on annual training. Actually, the annual training requirements state that the training with your team must be on your office's site specific plans, procedures, sanction policies and guidelines. Okay, so what does that mean? Taking a class on general HIPAA law does not satisfy this. The annual training requirements must be on your office's specific policies. What are your sanction policies? Sanction policies are punishments, okay? Your HIPAA plans have to be written in such a way that you say, here's a rule, Here's how you're gonna follow it. Here's what happens if you break the rule. You have to give them the sanction policies. That is what your training has to be on every year with your entire team. And within 14 days of having a new hire come in, they must receive that training as well. But it has to be on your office's site specific rules. If you get that training through an online course, do they know what your password policies are? Do they know that your passwords must have an uppercase, a lowercase, a number, and a special character, you know, shift one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine? They don't know that. Does the annual session instructor know what your punishment is if an employee shares their password with another employee? Do they know what websites your team is allowed to visit? Okay, because this is one that a lot of, lot of dental offices get hit with. Um, it causes a lot of problems because one of the main sources of viruses is personal emails. Okay, when I write a HIPAA plan for an office, the number one thing on that HIPAA plan is you do not access your personal AOL, email, Yahoo, Gmail, emails from your work computer ever because that's the number one source of viruses. Oh, look, so-and-so sent me a picture. Boom, you open it up. That person had their email hacked. They're your friend. You open up the picture they think you send. they sent you. Now your server has a ransomware virus on it because 
Sally tried to look at a picture of her best friend's kids, but her best friend's Gmail got hacked and used to send out 5,000 emails with viruses attached. It happens all the time. So <laughs> that, that training, those rules are not gonna be in a CE course. Listen, I, I, I teach 55 or 60 CE classes a year. There's no way I could sit in that CE class. I fly into Baltimore. I get there Thursday night, Friday morning at 8 a.m. My class starts. There's no way I could say, OK, you know, let me get the 60 dentists who are here and let me ask you all what your policies are. And that's what I'll train on. It's just not feasible. Okay, I can teach you the rules. You have to put them into place in your office. Online classes, CE, CE seminars, rep provided, you know, annual sessions, they're not compliant. They don't meet the training requirement for the annual training for your team. Okay. Please, please, this is a huge, huge pet peeve of mine. Okay. There's actually a few associations that I won't speak at. Because when I tell them, you know, this class is not going to meet the annual training requirements for the dentists and their teams, they say, well, we know that, but please don't tell people because we want to sell tickets. We want to put butts in the chair. So don't mention that during your presentation. I won't speak at those association meetings because I won't spread false information. I, I refuse. Um, <clears throat> know the rules, understand the rules have the policies and procedures in place and then you know quite honestly you don't if you have the policies and procedures you don't need to pay me to come in and do a training you don't need to pay somebody to do an online cert certification which by the way the office of civil rights recognizes absolutely no online hipaa certification of any sort that that they don't recognize it at all um you know, there are some states that require it for people, but it doesn't meet the federal requirement. Um, you know, please, 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 please have your policies, have your procedures, have your sanction policies written out, and then go through them with your team once a year. And that's your training. Everybody signs a sign in sheet and you're done. That's your training. That's what you need. That's what you have to do to be compliant. Nothing else is going to do it. No, no, please understand that because that, that's a big one for me. So, you know, the last myth that I want to talk about is HIPAA. I, you know, I hear this about OSHA and HIPAA all the time. HIPAA only exists to cause problems for providers. That's it. The only reason it's there is just to make our life difficult. In actuality, there are a lot of aspects to HIPAA that actually help you, that help your office, your patients, and that help your team. And it's not there to just make your life difficult. Does it make things difficult? Absolutely. Sometimes it does, especially if you don't follow the rules. However, there's also a lot of ways that it helps you. And that's something that, you know, people really need to understand is how it can help you. Okay. Protecting your network helps everyone. It helps you avoid fines. It helps your team by making your computers run better and faster, which is a huge plus for everybody. I mean, that, that's a huge plus. Everybody hates computer problems. I have them, you have them, Revenue Well has them, I'm sure. Um, everybody has issues with computers. They are not perfect. They are programmed by people who are not perfect. They are run by companies that are not perfect. It happens. But if you keep your systems up to date, keep your network protected, you have a less likelihood of having problems in general. The backup and disaster recovery requirements 
can be a huge help to you should anything ever happen in your office. Okay, think fire, mudslide, mudslide, flood, earthquake, 9-11, uh, the flooding in Houston, the rioting in Ferguson. Think about all those things. And then think about, okay, well, you know, Houston just flooded. I can't get to my dental office, but I have a patient who's requesting records and I have to be able to get them to them because, you know, the Office of Civil Rights doesn't care that your office just burnt to the ground last night. You need to be able to provide a copy of those records to that patient if they need them. So, you know, having a backup system, a disaster recovery plan is huge for you. It's a huge help and, you know, helps me sleep at night. And then probably the biggest help to us as practice owners is the new criminal components that were created by the final rule. Has anybody ever had, and you know, you can't raise your hand because we're not in a not in a seminar, but ever had a hygienist or an associate take patients' names and addresses, go work at another office, and then send a letter to every one of those patients saying, Hey, I cleaned your teeth last time, or you know, I was your dentist at this office, but I just want to let you know I've moved over here. I'm at this new office now. That is actually a criminal offense under the current HIPAA law. After the final rule, the omnibus rule in 2013, that became a criminal offense. It's called obtaining PHI or PII for the purpose of commercial advantage or personal gain. And it's a criminal offense punishable by 10 years in a federal prison and or a $250,000 fine. That's huge. But here's the problem. I just got a call. Uh, today's what? Thursday? Tuesday. Tuesday, I got a call from a dentist in Texas who just had this happen. And he said, I want to press charges. And I said, that's fantastic. Send me a copy of the sign-in sheet where you went over your HIPAA policies and told her you're not allowed to do this because it's a criminal offense under HIPAA. Oh, I never did that training. I, I, I didn't do that. That, it, that would have prevented this whole mess. That one simple little training, you know, two or three hours on a day off, would have prevented this whole thing from happening. Now, now it becomes, yes, you have to report it because technically you've had a breach. It, it has to be reported to the OCR. Patients are coming in with copies of the letters that the hygienist mailed out. It's, it's not a good scene. Um, but you know, chances are they're both gonna be in trouble. One's, one's gonna get their, their hand slapped for not doing the training the other one could potentially end up in jail for the next 10 years and lose her license forever. You know, she'll never be able to get a license again if she's convicted of, of a HIPAA criminal offense. So, you know, please put the training out there because the last thing any of us want is to have to call the Office of Civil Rights and say we had a breach and we had a breach because I didn't train my team properly. That's that's the absolute last thing anybody wants to happen. So train your team, let them understand and you know something like this this can help us. This this can help us avoid those nasty ridiculous situations that we get ourselves into that truly could have been avoided if we just followed the rules told them to our teams and made sure they understood all of them. So, you know, please, 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 you don't need a signed records release. Remember that. Again, another way HIPAA is helping you. 
you don't need it. So it alleviates stress. It alleviates that phone call to the to the patient. Now, I would still call them and say, hey, why are you switching? Unless they moved, they, they left the state, they whatever. But, you know, if they're switched into a dentist down the street, I would absolutely still call them, hey, what did we do? How did we mess up? Where did we screw up? What did we do wrong to make you leave? Find out, try and save them. But I wouldn't call them to get a signed records release. So, you know, one more thing you don't have to stress about if you know the rules. So, you know, I want to thank everybody for attending, you know, and definitely thank Jonathan and thank Revenue Well for having me here. Um, you know, certainly appreciate it. I know Jonathan will be sending out an email. I do want to get to the Q&A pretty quickly. Um, but, you know, I know Jonathan will be sending out a, a, an email over the next few days, wrapping everything up. I'm going to ask him to put my contact information on there. If anybody has a question that we don't get to, shoot me an email. I am more than happy to answer any questions that I can. So, you know, with that, thank you very much. And, you know, Jonathan, if you want to hop on to question Q&A, let's, let's do it. Let's do it. That was wonderful. I learned so much. I hope everybody else has. And um, we have a lot of questions, so let's get right to it. I actually think we may end up running a little overtime if we catch a little uh, headwind. But again, this uh, recording will be sent out and we'll have Rick's contact info um, for anybody who wants to ask him specific questions after the fact. So with that, let's jump right in. Our first question was, um, what constitutes PHI and PII? Well, PHI is protected health information. That is, <coughs> excuse me, anything that gives specifics about the treatment of a patient. Okay, one of the things I hear all the time is, oh, I was told that having a sign-in sheet is illegal. If you're a general dentist, that's not illegal. If you are a oncologist, it is, because there's only one reason people go to an oncologist. So that sign-in sheet is telling the people there, this is what you have, this is why you're there. The, the true definition of PHI is, again, it, it stands for protected health information, okay? And it's anything that reveals information about services a person is having done or has had done notes, chart notes, ledgers, x-rays, okay? PII is personally identifiable information. 41 of the 50 states have ruled that a name and a city are considered PII if they're together. So they're personally identifiable information. What makes it so you can identify someone? You know, I think about Think about my name. There are three Richard Garfolos living in the world right now. One of them is the vice president of Kraft Foods, and I've never met him. I don't know who he is, and I've never seen him. I'm one, and my son is one. If you said Richard Garfolo from Valley Forge, Pennsylvania, people are going to know who it is. They're going to know who you're talking about. That's P-I-I. -I. Okay. Name address, social security number, date of birth, any information that can be used to identify that person. Okay. <coughs> PHI is any form, and you know, please remember it can be electronic, it can be spoken, it's any information about a specific patient's health, health history, planned procedures, completed procedures, you know, their medical history form, all of that is considered PHI. It's protected health information. And you know, it's all of the medical info we have about the patient. Um, PII is all of their personal information name, address, telephone number, date of birth, email address. That's all PII. You are allowed to share those things with 
consent or within the guidelines of TPO, treatment, payment, or operations. So hopefully that answered the question. Okay, our next question is, per myth number two, are records release forms now obsolete? I believe they are. However, if a patient came into the office to pick it up, I would have them sign not a receipt, not a uh, release, but a acknowledgement of receipt that they did receive them. If I'm emailing them to another provider, I'm not going to worry about it. I have my paper trail. But if the patient themselves comes into the office to pick up printed out x-rays and you know copied chart pages i'm gonna have them sign a receipt but absolutely not a release i do i do truly believe after the final rule and you know if you just google 2013 final rule hipaa releasing records to another provider it doesn't need consent <laughs> doesn't you don't need the records release it's, it's right on the hhs website um, so yeah, they are they are obsolete at this point. And you know, when when I call a doctor and they tell me I need one, I email them a copy or a link to that website. And nine times out of ten, they'll send it right over to me. They just they just don't know. Okay, we're gonna go to the next one, which is what's a reasonable amount. Um, for a practice to pay to get an annual risk assessment, or uh, can a practice do it themselves? You you can do it yourself. Um, you know, quite honestly, HIPAA uses a term called usually called um, oh boy, the term just flew out of my head. Um, you know, adequate. It has to be adequate for your practice. Okay. Uh, what a reasonable amount is you could do it yourself. If you're a small office, you have three employees, you have six computers, you do it yourself and you know you have your written policies and that's fine. If you're a large office or you're a, a you know multiple office facility, it may be reasonable for the Office of Civil Rights to want you to have a professionally done one. Honestly, everybody, everybody in the business is a little different. Have your IT company do it, okay? We do it. We do them for clients all the time. We go in, you know, I have a, a software program that runs a vulnerability assessment on every single workstation and server on the network. It takes about eight hours to run, and that software license costs me $60,000 a year. I, I, I charge to do that but it tells me every single security patch, every single update, you know, that your Microsoft Word version is out of date, that the last security patch for Microsoft that was released two days ago hasn't been installed. I get literally on a 10 workstation office, I get over a thousand pages worth of results on average. You can do it yourself if it would be considered reasonable for you to do it yourself, okay? And it's up to each individual office to determine what's reasonable for them. The only thing you have to remember is if the Office of Civil Rights comes in to do an inspection or an audit, you have to be able to prove that the way you chose to do it was actually a reasonable way to do it. That's the hard part. There really isn't a standard fee. It's, it's just, I, mean, I wish I could tell you, you know, 5,000, 10,000, 1,000. There's just so many factors. You know, when, when I do them, I fly out with a team of people. I, I'm in the office for three days. It's, it's not inexpensive, but we're also not doing that for three computer, two provider offices. We're, we're you know, it's not worth it. It's not worth it. And I wouldn't even suggest it because it wouldn't be reasonable. So, you know, think about what's reasonable, what you as the dentist or as the owner or as the manager consider reasonable, it, it works. You know, I, I think we spend so much time worrying about 
how much something costs, it never gets done. And just like we tell patients, the most expensive thing you can do in dentistry is neglect your care. It's the same thing with HIPAA. The most expensive thing you can do is do nothing. So at least do something because it's going to save you money in the long run. Uh, this next one's going to put you on the spot a little bit, and it's specific. Um, in terms of reasonable time for release, what's the law for Iowa? Uh, let me pull up my spreadsheet. Hold on one second. <laughs> and I'll give you a follow-up to that one as well while you're looking, Rick. Is um, What are the three states where you cannot send a patient ledger? Uh, Colorado, Hawaii, and Alaska. Excellent. That one I know off the top of my head. And in Iowa, it is a 30-day time period. So it follows the federal guideline. Um, and you can charge $1 per page for copying records in Iowa. Um, in regards to myth number three, what was the uh, accounting of disclosure that you discussed? An accounting of disclosures is basically a list of every single time a patient's protected health information was accessed by anyone at your facility. Unfortunately, there is no dental software that makes it easy to do. But when I said, the example I gave was I used it for my daughter. My daughter, her senior year of high school had um, kidney cancer. She had renal cell. And our insurance company, Blue Cross, in their infinite wisdom, decided they were not going to pay for her six-month post-op MRI. Wasn't worth the investment. Um, we got a letter saying, we're sorry, you know, the, the pre-approval request from such and such doctor at Children's Hospital Philadelphia has been denied based on the clinical advice of our advisor. So I called them and submitted a request for an accounting of disclosures. I wanted the name and license number and position of every person who had accessed her record, her medical record and chart that worked for the insurance company. 15 minutes later, I got a call from Children's Hospital of Philadelphia saying, hey, we just got the approval for your daughter's PET scan for her MRI. So didn't even <laughs> didn't even have to have to get they still had to send it to me but they didn't want me to see that it wasn't a doctor so you know what that is is a list of every time somebody in your office viewed or disclosed that patient's information so you know, i go down the ledger okay you know dr dina viewed it on this day cuz she did a chart note maggie viewed it on this day because she she did a profi on the person. Brenda saw it on this day because she took a PA. Um, you know, Monica at the front desk saw it this day because she submitted a claim and updated the patient's medical history. It, it, it can be a time consuming process. The chances of you getting a request for one are slim, but you know, understand, I also use those to my advantage. If we have a claim that gets denied over and over and over, based on the clinical opinion of our advisor, we are not going to pay for this crown because the periodontal outlook on the tooth is not favorable. I call the patient and say, hey, do me a favor. Call Delta Dental or call MetLife or call Aetna, whoever it is, and request an accounting of disclosures. Let's get the name and license number of this advisor who is telling them you have periodontal disease and they're not paying for the crown. So, you know, again, use it to your advantage because it has to be provided. Okay, we had a couple questions here that are really good. Um, they tie together. Um, can you, when you're giving information over to a new practice, can you disclose notes uh, about a patient account? Um, are you okay to provide those? As long as you're not in one of those three states, absolutely. 
Okay, in that same vein, um, when referring a patient to another practice, can you give uh, the personal information on whom you should be talking with about their health issues? No. You can send copies of any um, HIPAA disclosure requests. Like if you have a patient who says, please talk to my wife or you can talk to my wife, you can send copies of those, but you shouldn't be manually alerting the other office that, hey, you should only talk to his wife or you should only talk to, that's, that's something that that office on their end has to deal with as far as what the husband wants done, okay? And you know, also remember, they do have a right to request that you don't share information with a spouse or a child as well. So, and, and that may have changed from your office to the other office. They may have changed their mind. So, you know, but that, that disclosure allowance, the yes, you can talk to my wife or yes, you should talk to my father, unless it's a court order and a custody issue, is only valid for your office. They have to redo it at the new office anyway. So that I would definitely not share. Um, it looks like we're at one o'clock right now. I'm still good to keep going. We have quite a few people on. Uh, are you okay to um, keep going for a little bit longer, Rick? I'm good. I have nowhere to be till 8.30 tomorrow morning. Okay, me neither. Um, so as long as we have a healthy amount of people still on the line, uh, we'll keep fielding questions here. No problem. Um, our next question is, is there an expiration date on signed HIPAA form? Uh, your notice of privacy practices has to be updated every four years, even if the only thing that changes is the date at the top of the notice of privacy practices, it must be updated every four years and the patients must sign a new acknowledgement of receipt of the notice of privacy practices. Other than that, any disclosure request or disclosure restriction is valid for 50 years after the patient's death. That's the expiration date. So you know, you, quick example here, I had a patient one time who came in and said, listen, I'm gonna fill out your paperwork, but I want you to never ever release my medical history to my wife, ever. We couldn't figure out why, but as we looked over the medical history, we realized he had been, um, he, he was in Korea during the, the Korean War, and he got married three days before he shipped out to Korea. While he was in Korea, he contracted a, a venereal disease while he was there. I don't know why he felt it was important to tell us that he had gonorrhea in 1953 or whatever year it was, but he, he felt that it was important to put that on his medical history. But then he specifically told us, do not ever share this with my wife or children. Signed a disclosure restriction request. After he passed away, his wife came in for copies of records, you know, to submit to insurance for something, I forget what. And we were not able to release the medical history to her because he signed a restriction request. It is valid not up until the minute they die, but for 50 years after they die. That's the expiration. So they're the only two. Notice of privacy practices expires every four years. Everything else is 50 years after the patient's date of death. Okay, uh, let's see here. We have a practice that does uh, CEDRs online and HIPAA training yearly, but um, now with the requirements, compared, uh, as what you said, they would like to know if there's something online or that can be accessed for them to use training yearly to get the specifics of criminal charges and or what they need to do specific to their office to make sure they're completely compliant. Well, 
you know, <laughs> excuse me, there, there's really the best source for that information is the Department of Health and Human Services website. Um, you know, your, your offices, policies and procedures have to be written in a way that they address the 196 audit control points that the Office of Civil Rights has created. They're the 196 things that they look at when they come into an office to do an audit or an inspection. When I write HIPAA programs, I write them to follow and address every single one of those 196 things. And then through training, I'm able to lump that down into probably about 80 or 90 slides, which takes about four hours, four hours to get through. Um, doing a, a training with your team so you know do a quick google search pull up the ocr audit control points use that because that's free that you get from the government for free use that as a guideline to write your office's plans and procedures you know, don't don't send any supplier $500 for a green binder for your written plans. Um, that's just a skeleton that you have to fill in the blank. Use the audit control points as your skeleton and just write one paragraph to address each one of those 196 audit control points. Review those different paragraphs that that training with your team, review those plans. And, and that's the training you need. It doesn't have to be online. It doesn't have to result in a certificate being given to you at the end because the OCR doesn't, doesn't, doesn't accept or recognize any type of certificate for any HIPAA training for your team. So you know, use that as a guide. Go to the HHS website. You can get those audit control points right there and the, the training is just on on your plans. You don't have to do it online. And it doesn't make life easier because it's not compliant. Okay, we have quite a few that are similar, so I'm gonna try and tie them together here for you. Go ahead. Um, our, so this one I thought was quite interesting. If the front office individual is speaking on the phone and uses a patient's first and last name, is this a violation? Um, and if the answer is yes, do you have any tips on how to avoid that? Unless they are saying, hey, Jane Smith, we'll see you tomorrow for your three crowns and two veneers, they're fine. It, it's really not a violation. Um, if that is the type of conversation that they're having, I would suggest they maybe go in the back to make that call rather than sit at the front desk with patients in the waiting room. One thing to bear in mind, the vast majority of complaints that the Office of Civil Rights receives are actually not complaints from the people whose information was leaked. It's complaints from the person who overheard it or who got the email accidentally because you mistyped it. That's who files most of the complaints. So, you know, you, you get a, a grumpy old curmudgeon sitting in your waiting room who knows just enough about the HIPAA law to be dangerous, overhears your front desk person say, you know, hey, Jane Smith, we'll see you tomorrow at 2.40. We're going to do those three crowns and we're going to do those two veneers and we're going to do that one root canal all at the same time. That's going to be the guy who calls in the complaint. So if you're just saying, you know, hey, John Smith, how are you? We want to get your recall scheduled. That's fine that's that's perfectly okay um but if you're specifically dictating planned procedures that's that's not okay and you know believe it or not a recall isn't really considered a planned procedure it's not not something it's still covered as phi but it's not something that ocr is going to freak out about just like they wouldn't freak out with a general general physician saying we want to get you scheduled for your annual physical 
that, that's not really releasing any information. You're not saying you have periodontal disease or anything like that, or you have diabetes. They're saying, we're just going to schedule your physical. We're going to schedule your cleaning. No. Big, big difference between cleaning slash annual physical and let's talk about the periodontal disease you have that's making your gums rot away and your teeth fall out. Okay. Um, let's say a practice sends thank you letters to patients who have referred a friend. Can they use the individual's first and last name? So, you know, hey, thanks so much for referring Jane Smith to us. We really appreciate that. Is that okay? Absolutely, because they're not specifically saying they are a patient or they're not specifically saying what they're doing. They're just saying thanks for the referral. You're not saying what you're doing on them when they're coming in, if they're actually even coming in. Okay. How about um, postcard, recall postcards? Are those okay? Recall postcards are absolutely okay. Um, actually, about three years ago, the Department of Health and Human Services released a statement specifically on recall and reminder postcards and stated it is perfectly acceptable unless the patient has requested that all mail come in a closed envelope. Now, again, 17 years, I've not had a single patient say, don't send me a postcard, it must be in a closed envelope. But you know, if the patient requests, I want all correspondence sent to me in a closed envelope, then that's what you have to do. But in 17 years, I've not ever seen it once. And, you know, talking to thousands and thousands and thousands of people, nobody even knows they have the right to request that. And you know, honestly, most reasonable people can't figure out why you would request it anyway. Um, in the same vein, uh, a simple envelope that uh, has return address on there, does that constitute PII? Not at all. Okay. Not um, at all. And actually, anything transmitted via the post office isn't covered because the post office is considered a conduit. And all you have to worry about is that it leaves your office. <laughs> it doesn't have to be protected. There's no way to encrypt regular mail. Okay. Um, I'm got a couple more here. We're not going to get to everybody's questions, but what I think is... Rick, you and I, we can record all these. We will send out an answer sheet for everybody just to ensure that everyone's questions um, have been covered. Absolutely. And again, we'll have your contact information. Um, we have a practice who uses encrypted emails, so they're covered there. But they're wondering, is it okay to send PHI and PII via fax? Yes. Yes, as long as you confirm the fax number and the patient verbally tells you it's okay, that's fine. Um, again, a, a fax machine, a telephone line is considered a conduit and doesn't have any limitations other than the patient has to request it. You know, you, one thing you can't do is fax a recall reminder. If a patient gives you their fax number, you can't fax them and say, hey, John Smith, you're late for your you know, you're past due for your recall, please give us a call. You can't do that because that's considered marketing. Um, and it would be an unsolicited fax, which is a violation of a whole different set of rules. However, if the patient says, hey, can you please fax me a copy of this or a statement or a bill or, you know, something that has a list of every service I've ever had done along with a couple chart notes, you absolutely can do that. It just has to be requested by the patient. Okay, and we had, a, for our final one, we had a, quite a few questions about this. To me, it sounds like a good plug opportunity for you, but you can be the judge. Um, do you know anybody who writes or creates specific HIPAA, HIPAA guidelines? Uh, is there anybody you can recommend? Where can um, somebody obtain a HIPAA plan to train their employees? Um, well, I mean, we, you know, have, we, we definitely do that. I've been doing it for for 15 years and I've written probably about 4,000 offices um, site-specific 
OSHA and HIPAA plans and procedures. So, you know, we can definitely do that and help you out with that if you need it. If you have the time to invest, again, go to the Department of Health and Human Services website, Google the audit control points for the Office of Civil Rights, and that becomes your guideline to write your plans. Okay, I'm not a big fan of the, you know, let me give my supplier 500 bucks and they'll send me my green binder with fill in the blank pre-written plans. Because if you don't fill them out and you don't do the training properly, they can actually increase your fines because it goes from a, a less than serious violation to willful neglect. And that actually increases the fines by about 10 times. So I'm not a big fan of those. Write your own, use the audit control points as a guide. And if you don't wanna do it, you certainly can give us a call. We work in all 50 states as well as through the rest of the world. I was in Bangkok last year and you know, I'm, I'm all over the place. So we work all over and you know, we typically can come in and in about three days we can write both your OSHA and your HIPAA plans and do a complete team training. So we can definitely help you out with it, but if, if you have the time and you have the patience, pull the audit control points, you can certainly do it yourself. It, it's gonna take you some time. It's not gonna be something that you're gonna finish in three days or 24 hours. You know, I come in with a team. I come in with a team of four people. We do a, a six hour on-site inspection. We run that eight hour vulnerability assessment. It's, it's a process, but you can do it yourself. You know, one, one kind of in closing thing here. Remember HIPAA is a journey. It's not a destination, okay? Your office is never ever going to be 100% HIPAA compliant because if you have computers in your office, part of HIPAA compliance is making sure your antivirus is 100% up to date. The problem is there are coders and hackers out there that are writing new viruses every day. So as quickly as your antivirus company creates a patch, creates a, a security block for a new virus, you do your update and you're protected. Before that update is even released out to your computer, there are 3,000 new viruses out there. So, you know, HIPAA is a journey, not a destination. And the important thing is you want to just make sure you're constantly moving forward on the journey. You're never going to get there. You are never going to be 100% HIPAA compliant. It's not possible. But you can be further along on the journey than most other people are. And that's the important thing. You know, be on the journey. Rick, thank you so much. This has been incredibly insightful. Um, we've had some questions for your email address. It's rick at practicemechanic.com. Right. Is that correct? That's correct. Awesome. And so everybody knows, again, we will send out a recording of this when we follow up. We've had some requests for the slide deck. Um, we will send that out as well. We'll also have another um, handout that pertains to this. Um, if we didn't get to your questions, they were just piling up. Um, my apologies. I kind of feel like we may have to have another webinar that's just straight Q&A. I think that could be kind of fun. Um, and you can email those to me. Um, I'll try and record as many of them that have been um, uh, put in here. My email address is J Bass, J B A S S at revenuewell.com. Um, we will compile them. We will send them out so everybody um, has their questions answered. Everybody, thank you so much for attending. We really appreciate it. Again, Rick, thank you. This has been awesome. And uh, I hope everybody has a really nice day. Thank you.